So what's the point of an MPLS VPN? How did they come to be? And why are they still employed today? What do they offer to the customer that's so nice? In this video, what we're going to talk about is why they exist and why service providers offer them to their customers. Then we're going to talk about how we can start to see it in action. We're going to see it on a diagram and see why MPLS VPNs are so special and so interesting to deploy. Let's get going talking about what MPLS VPNs bring to the table and what you can expect to learn over the upcoming videos. Let's go. So when you talk about what is the point of MPLS VPNs or MPLS Layer 3 VPNs, it does beg the question, what is the point of a VPN in the first place? Why do customers want to use VPNs? Then we can transition a little bit into talking about why they would choose an MPLS VPN over something that they could deploy themselves, like an IPsec site-to-site -site VPN. So here's a topology that we're going to be working with over the next few sets of videos. This is going to be pretty much my MPLS VPN topology. We may add more prefixes to it. Sitting in the center of the white section, of course, we have our service provider. And then we've got two customers. We've kind of color-coded these customers here. We've got a peachish, pinkish, reddish customer. And then we've got a green customer. Now, the whole idea here is that my customer, customer one, let's just pick on them. They want their users, let's just put like a little LAN here, to be able to securely talk over the internet or over a service provider's backbone to their other site here. So maybe they've got this customer here that's going to reach out to the internet and this customer edge device here that's reaching out to the internet. But we want a server here to be able to serve our customer or our end users over here on this site. Not an uncommon scenario, is it? Where we may have, you know, Bob sits at his computer and he wants to access a file share that's located at HQ. This is a very common thing. But the kicker is, is now they have to do it in a secure manner. Would it be wise or advisable for us to just open port 445, that's SMB traffic, to the public internet? That way, you know, Bob could come along and, you know, maybe he still has to authenticate or something, sure with a username and password but the point is is bob would be doing that over the public internet if we were just to open smb up to the internet no we don't want to do this this is bad of course this is bad the same thing the big one i mean how many times have we seen rdp open to the public internet and a hacker just finds their way in maybe they fish out passwords or they do some form of brute brute force attack you get the idea and now they've rdp'd into a terminal server it's been open to the internet. I personally have dealt with these scenarios with clients before. We tell them, don't do this, and this is the first thing they want to do is, oh, it'll never happen to us. Anyways, <laughs> you get the point. The point is, is we need customers' traffic to be securely brought from one physical location to the other. This is the point of VPNs. We have this whole infrastructure here, right? This is a router here and a router here and a router here. And these prefixes have to get shared throughout. That way, our customer, one way or another, could reach the other site here, even if these are public IP addresses. So if I write V, P, and N here, let's explore the V. The V stands for virtual. The idea here is that we are logically building a network on top of this physical backbone. Oftentimes, this is referred to as a fabric. So instead of the customer seeing this as they have to hop from here, to hop from here, to hop from here, to hop from here, to hop from here. No, instead, the customer just wants to see it as almost as if they have one direct subnet right here. This is sometimes referred to as a pseudo wire, fake wire. So they believe that logically they are directly connected by some sort of tunnel or some sort of directly subnet because of the virtual nature nature of how this works. Now, there are lots of technologies that can provide a virtual network from our customer to the other, but the P is where it starts to get tricky. Private. The idea here is that our customer wants to know that their traffic is perfectly isolated from other customers' traffic, that it's not using just the shared public infrastructure to do this. Sometimes they can add their own privacy using encryption suites like IPsec. But if they were to use something that's a little more plain text, like layer two tunneling protocol, then they may be getting the virtual nature of their tunnel, but they're not getting the private nature of their tunnel. And this is where the private becomes a big deal. 
And then lastly, of course, this is a network that one kind of goes without saying. So now we kind of understand the use case for a VPN in general. The idea is I have traffic like Bob's traffic here that needs to reach my server over here. It needs to do this in a virtual logical way. That way we don't see the entire infrastructure of our service provider or nay, the entire internet itself. We just want it to appear like we have a direct connection to our neighbor. But further, it has to be private. We want to be isolated from all of the other traffic that's out there on the internet. Internet. And further, if we can, we'd like to add encryption into the mix. And then, of course, this is a network. So a virtual private network isn't just seeing a logical tunnel from one end to the other. It's also keeping that privacy in play here that's a very big deal. So customers, when they now realize that we need a virtual private network to reach, you know, so that Bob can reach the server over here, they have a couple different options of creating a VPN. And you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and say this. I'm gonna venture to say that the smaller the client, the more likely the client is to have a do-it-yourself kind of deployment to virtual private networks. They may want to opt for a site-to-site -site IPsec VPN. This is where the customer deploys a firewall and just gets a public internet connection from the service provider. They deploy a firewall here over on their own site here and get a public internet connection from the same service provider or a different service provider. And then we point these firewalls towards each other and they build a secure VPN tunnel. IPsec is just a phenomenal suite of technologies that go into play here. And of course, we're not going to get into building an IPsec tunnel. There are a, just a ton of different ways that you can learn about how to deploy IPsec tunnels here on CBT Nuggets. And yes, I am going to be working on the Juniper security track coming up where you'll learn how to deploy IPsec tunnels on SRX series firewalls. It's not here yet, but it will be on the way. That being said, if you're just curious about IPsec firewalls, you can learn about it in Network Plus, Security Plus, us, uh, CCNP security. You can learn about it in our firepower content. You can learn about it in Palo Alto content. We've got IPsec out the wazoo here at CBT Nuggets, and I'd encourage you to dig more into it. But this is the, the use case when the customer is looking for something maybe a little more affordable and they want to do it themselves. That's what the IPsec site to site VPN is all about. What we as a service provider can do though is say, hey, don't worry about handling all of that suite of protocols, buying new hardware, maintaining it yourself. You can just share to us the prefixes that you want to be sent from one site to the next, and we will handle tunneling it for you. This is where the MPLS Layer 3 VPN or the Layer 2 VPN comes into play. With the MPLS Layer 3 VPN, the customer will send us actual prefixes, IPv4 prefixes, that they want us to send across our topology towards their other site. So the customer here will just be able to look in their routing table and they will see this other sites, all of the prefixes that they share, they'll see it there, and they know that the next hop is just punt it to the service provider and they'll handle getting it the rest of the way there. The flip side of that is Layer 2 VPN. With Layer 2 VPN, the customer literally sees this as a Layer 2 connection from one end to the other. If you're following along in your Juniper journey throughout CBT Nuggets, you've already seen a little bit of Layer 2 VPN technology in action, haven't you? When you deployed Q and Q technologies as part of the JNCIS content here on CBT Nuggets. However, that didn't really use very much MPLS at the end of the day. What we're here to talk about now is MPLS technology. MPLS really flipped the script. It really changed how all of this stuff worked and it enables us to do insanely cool things when you couple it with other technologies like BGP. Now, I don't want to get into this too much because it will be overwhelming very, very fast. What I'm just trying to tell you right now is that MPLS solved problems for the service providers, especially in the late 90s and early 2000s. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, yeah, there was Ethernet, and IPv4, but there was also ATM, and there was also Frame Relay. Now those things, you know, you don't see uh, ATM or Frame Relay much anymore, but what MPLS brought to the table was our ability to receive prefixes on one of these types of transports, and we were able to tunnel them across our entire network towards the other end. When we combine this with multi-protocol BGP, 
we were able to do this in such a way that it added a layer of segmentation. I don't want to say privacy, but it added a layer of segmentation that kept our customers' prefixes completely separate from our own prefixes or our other customers' prefixes. The end result by doing that was that we could use a subnet like 10110 slash 24, our customer could use a subnet like 10110 slash 24, and then we could go get or recruit or sell to another customer who also used 10110 slash 24. And it didn't matter if they used ATM or Frame Relay or Ethernet, we were able to handle all of it. MPLS layer 3 VPNs or layer 2 VPNs made us as a service provider super, super flexible. That's what it really brought to the table. And when we go to customers now, we can say, don't worry about building out your WAN infrastructure. We will do it for you. All you have to do is just peer to us and we'll handle segmenting and sending your traffic from one end to the other. But beyond that, we can also add in SLAs into the mix. This is where we start to separate ourselves from a site-to-site -site VPN and just the public internet. Now we can also talk about things like bandwidth reservations. We can talk about things like uptime SLAs. We can make these guarantees that also add to our ability to provide unique services and upsell ourselves a little bit to the customers. The customers love this type of thing. So they can have an internet connection, but they can also have a private connection to their other sites that are guaranteed with uptime and bandwidth reservations. Then we can do things like WAN traffic engineering where we send our internet traffic outbound or some or, or our site destined traffic out towards the MPLS. This is where SD-WAN starts to come into play. So this has been understanding the point of VPNs and how MPLS VPNs bring something unique to the table. It's all about offloading our customers' responsibilities on to us, that's pretty cool, but keeping them segmented and we remain flexible regardless of the technologies that they want to tunnel. Now, let me go ahead and say this now too. We can tunnel basically anything that they want to do over MPLS now. We can tunnel things like IPv4 unicast, IPv4 multicast, IPv6 unicast, IPv6 multicast, and we can handle all of that through the magic of MPLS VPNs. Now, throughout this set of videos, we're going to talk fundamentally about how this works, how all of these things work. And the next set of videos, we're going to do a basic IPv4 unicast MPLS layer 3 VPN deployment. At that point, you'll be acclimated enough to how these technologies work to where you can start diving into the advanced MPLS VPN technologies and MPLS Layer 2 VPN technologies. So this sets up what we're trying to do, what we're trying to bring to the table, and what problem we're solving for our customers. Now it's time to talk about how does it really work. That's been understanding the point of MPLS VPNs. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.